So we're gonna start by just figuring out how to use our calculator to do square roots. For these answers, I'm rounding the answers to, I believe it's three decimals. Let me just double check what I said in the instructions. Three decimal places. So basically, if you're using the calculator that I recommend for this class, in order to find the square root button, you press second in the top left corner. Then you press the X squared button, which is next to the seven, and the root should appear. Once the root appears to do the first question, root of seven, I'm just gonna type in seven and parentheses and press enter. It comes up as a value of 2.64575. <clears throat> if I wanna round to three decimal places, this is the third decimal place, I'd be dropping this seven. Since this is five or larger, I round up. Dropping this means I raise the last digit by one. So my final answer would be 2.646. For part B, it's the same general idea. I just have a number outside of the root sign. So I type in the five. I again press second, X squared to bring up the root, and then I'm gonna put three in. When I get that, it tells me it's 8.6602. The fourth decimal place is four or lower. That means I can just drop it without having to round up the one in front of it. C is a little trickier than the two that came before. For this one, there's really an implied parentheses over the top. So the two ways I can do it is either I can do the whole top, five minus root six, press enter to get an answer, then divide by five, or I can include the parentheses so that the calculator knows to do the subtraction on top before it does the division on bottom. I'm gonna do it that way and put it in as parentheses five, minus second x squared to bring up the root, six, n parentheses to end the parentheses within the square root, n parentheses to end the whole top, then I can put in divided by five. So this is the way that it would look put into my calculator if I wanted to do it all at once. When I press enter, this gives me 0 0.5101, again, the digit that I'm looking to drop is this one, which is four or lower. So I can just get rid of it and get an answer of 0 0.510. These are the correct answers for A, B, and C in question one of the group work. When we're now looking at question two, we're involving variables. When we have the variables, the way that a variable works under a root is we take the root number and divide the current power by the root number. There is no number on these roots because the default is a root number of two or a square root. If you just see this symbol without any number there, you assume that a two's there the same way if you just see an X without any exponent, you assume it's X to the first. So these are all second or square roots, meaning for variables, I'm gonna take whatever the power is currently and divide it by two. So what really happens for X to the fourth is it becomes X to the four divided by two, which is just X squared. If I had something that started as an odd number, I'd want to separate it into the x that's going to be left behind and then the even part of the um, power that can come out. So like for instance, if it had been the root of x to the fifth, I would want to separate that into the root of x to the fourth times the root of x. This is the part that can't come out because I don't want to have a fractional power at the end. This is the part that can come out because it's an even number when I divide it by two, the root number, it'll come out with a whole number. So this final answer for the root of x to the fifth would have been x squared to the root of x, where the x squared comes out of the root from the even power, and the x really to the first that's left over stays under the square root. For part b, I wanna look at things as first a root of a coefficient and then a root of a variable. So really I'm breaking this up into the root of 36 and the root of x to the 18th. The root of 36 is a perfect square. Six times six gives me 36. So the root of 36 comes out as six. The root of 18, I do the way I did above. I divide by the root number, which here is an understood two. It becomes x to the 18 divided by two, which is really x to the ninth. For part C, notice this negative sign out front. It's like multiplying by a negative one, the same way up here in part B, we're multiplying by a five. That negative is important to include in my final answer, but it really doesn't impact how I do the root. 
how it would impact is if it was under the root, it would make it impossible to do because I can't take the square root of a negative number. That said, what I do here is I keep the negative sign. I take the b to the 14th and say 14 divided by 2 gives me 7. So outside it would become b to the 7th. I take the c to the 10th and say 10 divided by 2 gives me 5. So outside it would be c to the 5th. My final answer is negative b to the 7th, c to the 5th. For higher order roots, it's a little trickier how we put it into the calculator. Basically, we're going to translate this into a fractional exponent. What I mean by that is we're going to keep the negative 25 that's inside the root as the thing that we're acting upon, negative 25. But instead of trying to do a fifth root around it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it to the power of 1 divided by the root number. In this case, since it's a fifth root, 1 divided by 5. So I'm going to plug into my calculator, parentheses, negative 25, and parentheses to the power of, parentheses, 1 divided by 5. When I do that, it gives me an answer of negative 1.903. In this case, it says round to the nearest hundredth. Hundredth is the second decimal place, tenths, hundredths. If I'm rounding to this place, the thing that I'm dropping is four or less, so I can just get rid of it and my answer would be negative 1.90. When I go to use the same idea for the sixth root, I again take negative 25 to the power of one over the root number, except this time if I put it in, my calculator is gonna tell me it's an error. So when I go to one six, it gives me this domain error. The reason that it gives me a domain error is because I can't take the negative of an even-numbered root. The reason for that, if I take two negatives and multiply them together, they have to give me a positive. If I take two more and multiply them together, they have to give me a positive. So if I have four numbers being multiplied, doesn't matter if they start negative or positive. Once I multiply something by itself four times, it ends up positive. Same thing for six times, eight times, ten times. Any time that I'm doing it an even number of times, I must have an even number under the root or else the answer does not exist. As opposed to here, when it was a fifth root, if I took a negative times itself five times, these times would make it positive, these times would make it positive again, but then that odd numbered one, the fifth one, could be negative and make everything negative again. So I can take an odd numbered root, like the fifth or seventh of a negative number, I can't take an even numbered root, like a sixth or the one we're most used to, a square root of a negative number. So in this case, I would write my answer as does not exist. I can do the seventh root though. To do the seventh root, I again put negative 25 in parentheses, take the power of now one over seven, one divided by the root number. When I put that in, my calculator tells me an answer of negative 1.583. Again, I'm rounding to the nearest hundredth, so I look at the thousandth digit, since it's four or less, I can drop it without having to round up. When I'm looking at variables of higher ordered roots, I need to look at how many times the root number goes into the exponent evenly. To do that, I'm gonna write the root number's multiples. So here, I'm starting with four, four, eight, 12. I've now found one that's bigger than what's currently under the root. So the highest multiple of four that I can take out is eighth power. I can break this down into the fourth root of x to the eighth times the fourth root of what's left behind. If I took out eight of 10 of them, there's x squared left behind. I can then do the same thing I did with square roots, which was take power over root. This time, instead of dividing by two like we did with square roots, since it's a fourth root, I'm gonna divide by four. So it's gonna become x to the eighth divided by four outside of the root, the fourth root of x squared left behind. When I resolve eight divided by four, eight divided by four is two. So my final answer is x squared, the fourth root of x squared. When I look at b, the cube root of x to the 32nd, since it's a cube root, we'll be looking at multiples of three. I'm gonna have to write out a few before I get up near 32nd, but basically three, six, nine, 
12, 15, 18, 21, 24, 27, 30, 32 is when we went too far. So I'm going to break this up into x to the 30th, then what I have left over is x to the 2nd. I'm also going to treat the coefficients separately. So I'm going to look at this as three problems. The first one, the cube root of 27, then the cube root of x to the 30th, and then the cube root of x squared. This cube root of x to the 27th I could do in my calculator, or I could use that list of common squares and cubes, which I intend to give you guys physically when I see you next time in class, but you also can view in Canvas at the top of this new unit. It's going to list all the common squares and cubes so that I can recognize that 27 is really 3 times 3 times 3, or the cube of 3 is 27. When I take it out of the root, it just becomes a 3. This part that's going to come out of the root is x to the power divided by a root number. This part that's going to stay under the root can just stay under the cube root as the cube root of x squared. When I resolve this, 30 divided by 3 is 10, so I get 3x to the 10th, <coughs> the cube root of x squared. For c, it's only variables I have to worry about. So my multiples of 5, the root number, would be 5, 10, 15, 20. I can get up to 10 for the x to the 10th, so I can break that out as the fifth root of x to the 10th, and all of that will come out of the from under the root. For the 17th, that's somewhere between 15 and 20, so 15 is the biggest multiple of 5 I can take out of there, leaving behind 2. So it becomes the fifth root of y to the 15th, leaving behind the fifth root of y squared. I now translate this to power divided by root, x to the 10th divided by 5, y to the 15th divided by 5, and the part that's left under the root, the fifth root of y squared. My final answer then becomes x to the second power, because 10 divided by 5 is 2, y to the third power, because 15 divided by 5 is 3, and then under the fifth root is still a y squared. On the right side of the board, I've listed common squares and cubes. Again, there's a sheet that you can print out from Canvas. I plan to give you a copy of that sheet as we work through this unit, and I plan to let you use that sheet when you take the test. But basically, I've listed the squares 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, 81, 100, 121, 144, and the corresponding cubes 1, 8, 27, 64, 125, 216, 343, 512, 729, 1,000, 13, 31, and 1712. These correspond to the original numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Basically, if I take the square root of any of these numbers, I get back to what the square root is. If I take the cube root of any of these numbers, I get back to what the cube root is. So when I look at problem 5 in this group work, where it's asking me to do the root of 108, my goal is to find the largest number from this list of squares, which divides evenly into 108. The way that I'm going to suggest you do this is you start at the first number smaller than what's under the root sign. So in my list, that first number is 100. Divide 108 by 100. If I do 108 divided by 100, it gives me a decimal. I know that's not the right answer. So now I try 108 divided by 81. Again, it gives me a decimal, 108 divided by 64, again gives me a decimal, 108 divided by 49, decimal, 108 divided by 36 gives me 3. So I started at the bottom of the list working from something smaller than the number under the root until I got back to something that actually went in an even number of times. If I'd gone a different direction, say I'd started at the smallest square and worked down, it might be that I thought 4 went in, 4 does, but it would leave behind something that's a multiple of 9. Same thing if I started here, I could see 9 would go in, but it would leave behind what's a multiple of 4. So really by starting at the biggest possible numbers and working up, I can find something like 6, which has multiples 2 and 3, so that I know 36 is the largest square that goes in, not thinking that one of the ones that came before, 16 or 9, is the largest one that came in. So because 108 divided by 36 is 3, 
It means I can break this down into the root of 36 times the root of 3. The root of 36, perfect square, gives me 6. So my final answer here would be 6 root of 3. Basically, we're trying to find what's the perfect square cube that goes into the coefficient, and then what then would be left over when I divide by that perfect square cube. With 50, I would start here on my list at 49, decimal, decimal, 25 goes in exactly twice. So I could break this down into the root of 25 times the root of 2. Then I need to deal with the variables. We do the same thing we did previously. Because this is a square root, we're looking for the even number that can go in, the biggest even number that can go into this. x squared would be the biggest even number that can go in, leaving behind 1 from that x to the third power of the root of x. I can now take out the perfect square, 25, to get 5. The square root of x squared is x to the 2 over 2, or just x to the first. I put together the two things that came out, and they stay on the outside. Then under the root, the two things left over get multiplied. This 2 times this x means left over is 2x. So I started with 50x cubed. I found the largest perfect square to go into 50 was 25. The largest perfect square to go into x cubed was x squared. I took those two parts out and multiplied together outside of the root. I took the two parts that were left over and multiplied them together inside the root. For number seven, we're now doing cube roots. So the key difference between how we did number five and how we'll do number seven is we're reading from this list of cubes instead of from this list of squares. 375, I'm gonna start here at 343. If I do 375 divided by 343, I get a decimal. If I do 375 divided by 216, I get a decimal. But if I do 375 divided by 125, that gives me a whole number three. So that tells me I can break this up into the cube root of 125 times the cube root of three. This is on my list of perfect cubes. It's here, and it points me back to the number five, which is the cube root of 125. So my final answer here becomes five, the cube root of three. For number eight, since I begin at 686, this is the first number under 686. 686 divided by 512 gives me a decimal. 686 divided by 343 gives me a whole number two. So 343 is the perfect cube that goes into this. I break it up into the cube root of 343 times the cube root of two. 343 was on my list, pointing me back to seven as the cube root of 343. So my final answer here would be seven, the cube root of two. The last two problems here are just variable problems. They don't have coefficients, so I don't need to worry about my list of cubes. I do need to worry about what's the small or what's the largest multiple of three that I can fit within each of these or, uh, exponents. So I list out the multiples of 3, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. For x to the 14th, it fits between these two, so x to the 12th is what I can take out. Cube root of x to the 12 leaves 14 minus 12, which is the cube root of x to the second behind. I then deal with the y, the 11th power is between 9 and 12, so that means that I should take out 9, Take the cube root of y to the ninth. That leaves behind 11 minus 9, which is the cube root of y to the second. When I do this division, 12 divided by 3, power divided by root, gives me x to the fourth. When I do it with the y, 9 divided by 3 gives me y to the third. This is the part that comes out and goes in front. The part that stays under the root is the cube root of this x squared times this y squared or x squared, y squared. For problem 10, if I really wanted to figure out how many or what the lowest multiple of three, the biggest multiple of three is that's less than 101, I'd be writing for quite some time. What I'm better off doing when I have an exponent that big is just dividing it by three. So if I do that, 101 divided by three gives me 33.66. So basically, I know 33 is the total number of times it goes in. If I did 33 times 3, that means 99 is the largest multiple of 3 that I can take out. 
This negative's a little tricky, because really with a cube root, it being on the inside or it being on the outside are mathematically identical. I'm used to bringing it out just so that then you know the term's negative, negative leads it, but really it'd be the same thing if you left it in or took it out. To make it match, what I'm gonna do is your multiple choice answer on the group work, I'm gonna take that negative out as I go. So this is gonna become negative the cube root of x to the 99th times the cube root of x to the second. I got the second by doing 101 minus 99, which gave me two. I got the 99 by saying, I'm gonna divide this power by the root number, whatever the whole number is. I can then multiply by the root number to figure out which part of it can be taken out. I know that 99 divided by three gives me 33. So what comes out is negative x to the 33rd, leaving behind the cube root of x squared. Please view the other videos in Canvas in order to try and attempt the online homework. I definitely will answer any of your Ask the Teacher questions or any emails. Um, otherwise, have a happy Thanksgiving.